Hello again, Baxter. Um, I can tell it's the same day because we're wearing the same top. Hello, viewer. Um, why are we here today? Well, we're here today um, for a bit of a bit of a self-serving thing because I'm I'm one of the inventors at uh, Ripple, which is a company which comes up with uh, novel ways of doing uh, old things and new ways of doing new things, um, which we then hawk in a, in a very mercenary way. Um, and we're here to talk about one of the Ripple inventions, which is how do you make uh, the world's perfect internal combustion engine? So, in answer to this question, we obviously have to go to the standard combustion engine and discuss exactly why it is so rubbish. Now, <laughs> fossil fuels are very, very energy dense. They're some of the most energy dense uh, kind of um, um, molecules uh, that we're aware of. Uh, huge uh, power is locked up in their little bonds. Um, and when we burn them, obviously, that, uh, that, that energy is released as heat uh, and the heat causes the gas um, uh, that's surrounded by to expand and it's that expansion uh, that we use uh, to provide power from our internal combustion engines. So for those of you who really don't know, uh, imagine a, a cylinder with one end blocked and you push a plunger into the other end and you have some flammable gas in there and you light the gas, the gas burns and expands and it fires the plunger out of the end, much like a cannon really. Um, now if you connect that plunger to a little drive rod uh, that goes to a crankshaft and produces a, a turning motion, when you burn the gas, uh, the plunger is pushed to the end of the cylinder and it drives one half of a turn uh, on the crankshaft um, and then under its own momentum hopefully it will then go back into the cylinder uh, and you know, be ready to go again. And so a series of pops um, turns the expanding gas into a, into a turning motion. It's not quite as simple as that. Uh, most engines are, are four-stroke engines, so what happens is um, you will pull your plunger out of your cylinder, not under power. So this is something which is powered either by other combustion strokes elsewhere or by momentum alone. And you suck uh, gas into the cylinder. And with that gas you suck in a little bit of fuel, which is kind of atomized by a, by a fuel injector. You then again, not under power, have to push the plunger back into the cylinder and compress that gas, which is obviously quite you know, energy, um, energy an energy requiring motion, if you like. You need to put energy in to do it. You compress the gas, and once the gas is compressed, you have a little spark or a diesel engine. Just the fact of compression uh, causes the gas uh, to um, burn and expand, and it pushes the cylinder uh, back out. So it's four stroke because you have to have uh, one stroke uh, to uh, one stroke to suck in the fuel and air, one stroke to compress the fuel and air, one power stroke as they call it to burn the fuel and air, and then the exhaust port opens and you get the next stroke, which is purely for exhaust. It blasts out the exhausted gas uh, out into the atmosphere and um, to warm it all up, and then you start going through the process again. So it's a four-stroke engine. Only one of the strokes, so one quarter of the strokes of all that action, if you like, is under power. Um, and that is how all pretty much internal combustion engines work, with the exception of a few oddities like the Wankel engine, uh, which works in a different way, which we're not going to bother talking about. Now, you probably already realised that there are ways in which that might be improved. So, for instance, the fact that three of your strokes uh, are energy requiring, and any one of them actually kind of delivers uh, delivers energy to your system, it may seem rather wasteful. Um, but the main one actually is that when you uh, suck in fuel and air into a cylinder, and let's say it's a one litre cylinder, you suck your fuel air in, you compress it down to um, your combustion you know, ratios, let's say it's 10 to 1. You then burn the gas, but you can only expand out to one litre, because then the engine goes through its stroke again. And once you expand out to one litre, you open the exhaust. And what happens when you open the exhaust is you get a huge explosion uh, of heated gas coming out of the exhaust of the car, which has to go through your exhaust, the, what you would call the exhaust on the car, which baffles the noise. Um, but if you've got like a load of um, you know, junk cars like I have through my life and the exhaust falls off, you'll notice that a lot of explosive power is actually wasted down that tube. What you would usually do if you took a litre of air and atmospheric pressure containing a certain amount of fuel and then you squashed it and burned it, is you could probably expand that out to three or four, five times um, the volume of the cylinder before the air had reached atmospheric pressure again. The fact you can't do that means an enormous amount of the embedded energy in the fossil fuel is actually wasted straight out of the exhaust. So the perfect combustion engine, or internal combustion engine, would require a litre of compression and say five litres of expansion, or however much it is that you want. And then 
it would somehow go back to, you know, uh, it would exhaust and then only suck in the litre again and then bang and it would require a very strange setup because the drive shaft would be constantly changing shape and goodness knows what, which is part of the reason why we're still stuck with the standard four stroke, um, you know, one to one uh, ratio of expansion and compression. Um, there's also a lot of up and down movement uh, in an engine. Um, and up and down movement, where you accelerate and decelerate something lots of times, so for instance the cylinder head, you're wasting a certain amount of energy. You're having to take a block of metal and move it around up and down very fast and vibrate it, which it, it wishes to obviously wishes to carry on going in a straight line forever in line with Newton's laws. And so the engine's constantly having to, to drag itself back into shape and realign itself in order to continue uh, turning, um, which means that again, uh, energy is wasted. Uh, you've got a lot of uh, wasted energy in the fact that engines have lots of component parts which are all rubbing against each other like bilio, you know, lots of friction which you obviously then have to have a coolant in order to cool the engine and uh, you know, lots of oil in order to reduce the, uh, in order to reduce the friction. Um, the perfect engine, or well, the perfect internal combustion engine, would be an engine that had very few parts. The fewer parts, there's some few moving parts particularly, uh, the less wastage there is in energy in moving and accelerating and decelerating those parts. The perfect internal combustion engine would include parts that only ever went in one direction. In other words, the cylinder would just carry on going, somehow under power, somehow compressing, somehow expanding, whilst never actually changing uh, its direction of travel, which you know, obviously hasn't yet been achieved. But there is a way. Uh, in which something can continue to move in one direction infinitely without flying off in space and that thing can move around a circle. Um, so a cylinder can spin in one direction without having to constantly change its uh, direction of travel um, while staying in one place. And so it makes sense in the perfect combustion engine if you had as many of your components as possible going around and around in a circle and as few of your components as possible going backwards and forwards in a linear direction. Uh, the other thing that internal combustion engines have a little bit of a problem with is something called valve bounce. So when the engine uh, sucks in fuel, a little valve has to open in order to allow the fuel and air to come in. And then the valve has to shut in time for the engine to do the compression stroke, and then there's the explosion, and then another valve opens in order to allow the exhaust gas to come out. And that valve then has to shut before you get the next stroke drawing in the fuel and air which means that when you're revving the engine at really, really high speed, those valves have to move extraordinarily quickly. They have to open and close in a tiny proportion of the actual um, rotational cycle of the engine. And that can lead to a problem called valve bounce, because valves are usually run uh, using uh, on a spring. So you push the valve open and then let go and the spring snips back up and, and shuts the valve. The problem is it takes a certain amount of time for that valve to close with the force of the spring pushing it, and if you rev the engine too high, the valve doesn't actually have time to close and you end up with what they call valve bounce, which is that the, uh, the engine um, cylinder isn't isolated in the way that it should be at all, stages of its, at all stages of its work. As a result of all of these various wastages, apparently, according to Daryl Mann, uh, only about 5% of the embedded energy in the fossil fuel you put in your tank actually turns into the motion of your car. The rest is all wasted away to the outside air in the form of hot exhaust gases, heat in the engine, noise, rattling, crashing, banging, um, which we, you know, we try to utilise with our heaters and various other things. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that we're pouring 10 litres into our car and we're only actually getting like half a litre's worth of travel energy out of that. So, the question for anyone trying to uh, create the perfect internal combustion engine is how few working parts can you have? Is it possible to have working parts that only go around and around and no parts that go up and down? Is it possible to have an engine that doesn't have opening and closing valves? So valves, for instance, that are always open or always closed. So again, the valves are another up and down motion, which in a perfect world you would iron out. There are some valve engines which uh, involve cylinders with a scallop taken out of them and they spin and the more you rev the engine and they open and close, obviously they go around, so that's one way of doing it. But again, you've got another working part there, which again is not optimal. So we at Ripple 
have put our minds to this because it's a big question, especially for uh, for aeronautics, where internal combustion engines are unlikely to be superseded by batteries in the near future because batteries are not energy dense; they're very heavy, um, and it makes a lot more sense to fly planes um, using uh, fossil fuels still. And also, of course, because liquid fuels in the form of ethanol and in the form of biodiesel are going to be part of a green future. So the idea that electricity is green, uh, whereas liquid fuels are are not green. Uh, I think is more of a kind of like a hangover from the fact we're used to using fossil fuels and we haven't yet got our heads around the fact that you can use uh, other things um, which are you know just as green uh, as electricity but they're energy dense, they're light, you don't have to lunk them around. Um, if you think of the size of your fuel tank on your car and the distance you can travel on a fuel tank, fuel tank fuel, it's absolutely extraordinary how far you can go. Uh, a plane can fly from Britain to Australia on just the fuel that it carries on takeoff, uh, absolutely extraordinary uh, liquid fuels, and um, trying to imagine a future without them um, not only throws up a whole series of kind of like very difficult engineering challenges, but it's also not necessary. We can make green uh, liquid fuels. So the reason why I'm saying it's a little bit of a plug for Ripple is because we have such an engine, and pleased to say we have an engine uh, which you can completely adjust uh, the volume of the uh, compression stroke and you completely control the volume of the combustion stroke. Uh, it has very few moving parts, of either four. All of them go round and round. Uh, there are no opening uh, and closing valves, and there's a possibility, although it's just an outline possibility, that it may not even require lubrication. Now, I would love to tell you folks at home exactly how it's done, but that's not the business model. If you would like to uh, see uh, the Ripple internal combustion engine, if you would like to see the, uh, what I like to think is the future of internal combustion engines, uh, then please do click on the link, which is uh, here. <laughs> and you'd have to sign an NDA, but this is part of what we do here at Ripple. So we come up with new solutions to things, but obviously, you know, we have to put food on the table too. So the mechanical solutions to mechanical problems are available if you wish to see them. Uh, and they're also available to buy uh, sole access to if you wish to buy sole access to them. Uh, to explain our business model a little bit, um, what happens is if nobody's interested in having sole access to any of the inventions, we simply put them online and you'll be able to see them in six months to 12 months on this channel and they'll be available to everyone. So we're not gonna try and defend any patents or anything like that. We're essentially going to come up with something, we're going to have a 12 month period of grace where another company who is interested in that kind of thing can choose to purchase the patent and have it for themselves. And if they don't choose to purchase the patent, as they may well not, what happens is everyone gets it and the world can share it. Uh, so that's the perfect internal combustion engine. It's an engine that has rotating parts, that has very few parts, that has no opening and closing valves, and that has complete control over the ratios of the expansion uh, and uh, compression and combustion cycle. Uh, we think we've got that pinned down and uh, we'd love you to see it too. So uh, click the link and um, find out where it is. So Baxter, um, often when I'm talking to uh, apparently very well informed people um, about some of the technology we deal with, AI, 5G, that sort of stuff, they get very excited. The, uh, the, it's very fashionable, those terms. People nod uh, um, uh, energetically, even though sometimes I'm fairly confident they don't really know what they are, uh, AI and 5G. But when I start bringing up our internal combustion engine, uh, the Ripple Rotary, um, then as soon as I mention internal combustion, hydrocarbons, I immediately I can see a, there's a barrier coming up uh, because it's not very fashionable, it, they don't perceive it as being a green solution or renewables or uh, sustainable or regenerative or anything like this. So is there anything you can say to um, help people understand the importance uh, for um, developing the next generation of internal combustion engine for, for the plight of mankind? Okay, poor old mankind. Um... <laughs> Yeah, what I would say is this. Um, essentially, there are things that are in fashion and there are things that are not in fashion. Um, it may well be that an existing form of technology is out of fashion, um, but it is, in fact, what holds within it the possibility of being the future source of our power needs and that a large number of people who might otherwise grasp that miss it simply because they switch off because it's not in fashion. Uh, that's ridiculous. 
The truth of the matter is, if I could wave a magic wand now and have all the internal combustion cars in the country become 10 times as efficient, that would be serving uh, the green agenda. Um, especially when it comes to Air and Orsix, where internal combustion and liquid fuels are unlikely to be going out anytime soon. Anything that can be done to make them more efficient is going to be serving uh, the green agenda. Um, as I said in the previous piece, uh, it's also perfectly accurate to say um, that you can make green liquid fuels. So essentially, if you are turning something down or not investigating something because it's out of fashion, it may well be that you're missing something obvious. Uh, don't worry about fashion. Um, you should always take the best route uh, rather than the one which is the trendiest or going to get you the most likes. So you almost to be forward facing, sometimes you need to look backwards, uh, but uh, to you know an improved lens, if you will. Yeah, well, you know, essentially. Um, Batteries may appear to be green at source because they don't produce any CO2 at source, but what filled up the battery? I mean, at the end of the day, people are still burning gas and they're still burning coal in order to generate the electricity. All that we're doing is putting our you know, choking greenhouse gases at one step removed in order to make ourselves feel better, which is counterproductive. Uh, if you're really interested in saving the planet, what you need to do is utilize all possible available technologies to the out, out, outermost of their efficiency. Internal combustion engines are going to be part of the future. They can be part of a green future. And to glaze over, because they're not involving lithium ions or something like that, uh, you may be missing something that actually you really rather find exciting. Excellent. Thank you.